Hello everybody, welcome back. Just a quick video today on Surah 2, Ayah 256, which states in part, There shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. The right course has become clear from the wrong. So, I'm going to talk about uh, this verse a little bit today, and this is the often cited verse when Muslims say Islam is a religion of peace. There's no compulsion in religion. I'm going to show you that there are multiple ways of interpreting that verse and uh, look at a couple of specific examples. So we'll start with Ibn Kathir's tafsir. Now this is not the version of Ibn Kathir's tafsir that you're going to find online, at least to my knowledge. Um, so his tafsir, of course, is lengthy and different Islamic scholars will abridge it and translate different parts of it rather than translating the whole thing. So this is abridged by Sheikh Mohammed Nasib al-Rafi'i. All right, so this is the, this is his version of um, the uh, or his abridged version of Ibn Kathir's tafsir. So Kathir starts off by saying, of course he cites the verse Surah al-Baqarah 256 and he says um, Allah says there is no compulsion in religion, meaning do not force anyone to embrace Islam because it is clear and its proofs and evidences are manifest. Whoever Allah guides and opens his heart to Islam has indeed embraced it with clear evidence. Whoever Allah misguides, blinds his heart, and has set a seal on his hearing and a covering on his eyes cannot embrace Islam by force. So Islam is very deterministic. If you read Sahih Muslim, at least uh, my collection of Sahih Muslim is the Dar al-Salam numbering system. So right around the 6700s is where, uh, or where a lot of these conversations take place between Muhammad and his contemporaries. And they ask even about day-to-day -day activities. Are these determined? And the answer is, uh, from Muhammad is yes. Same thing in Sahih al-Bukhari in the 4900s. You'll find very, very similar narrations. And of course, this is similar to the Quran, Surah 639, 7178, 1099. Uh, Allah sets on a straight path whom he will and sends astray whom he will. Allah could have made the whole world uh, Muslims, but decided he didn't want to for whatever reason. So uh, even down to you know the day-to-day -day le level, your activities are determined by Allah. The ink has dried, as Muhammad would say. And I think that's what Kathir's getting at here. There's some theological messaging. You can't compel anyone to accept Islam not because you're supposed to be nice to everybody, but because Allah has decreed who will and who will not accept Islam, and so you can't overturn Allah's decree. Okay, so that's the first part. I think it's a lot more theological than uh, many Muslims would like to interpret it. So Kathir gives two reasons that this ayah was revealed, and of course they conflict. It's funny how much corruption there is in the early Islamic sources. They can't even agree on why uh, ayah 256 was revealed here. One of them is that um, there was a vow that some people had made to convert their children to Judaism. And uh, upon this, the ayah was revealed, there's no compulsion in religion. Another option that Kathir states is uh, that there was a man who was a Christian, or actually had two sons who converted to Christianity, but he was a Muslim. So his question was, should I force my sons to convert to Islam? And Muhammad said, no, there's no compulsion in religion. Now, neither one of these are relevant for Kathir, because he states, this verse is abrogated by the verse of fighting. Okay, and he quotes Surah 48.16 and Surah 9, of course, 73 and 123. So then Kathir continues, Therefore, all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fault till they are killed. Okay, so... For Kathir, it's abrogated. One of the most influential commentators in the history of Sunni Islam says, All people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fault till they are killed. And now you know why the uh, abridged version that is online doesn't contain certain parts of Ibn Kathir's tafsir. These aren't things that Muslims want you to read. But those are Kathir's words. So regardless of why Surah 2256 was revealed, for Kathir it doesn't matter. It's abrogated by the verses of fighting. So now you look at Muhammad's life and you say, okay, is this the life of a man who didn't compel people to accept Islam? Well, look at Surah 8, Surah 9. Look at, again, Kathir's work, Battles of the Prophet. 
Uh, look at the Hadith, the books of Jihad, Kitab al-Jihad and Sahih al-Bukhari, for example. And I'll give you a specific example from Sahih Muslim uh, that doesn't have anything to do with fighting, but certainly has to do with compulsion. So again, my copy is Dar al-Salam, um, and in that numbering system, it's 4589. For other numbering systems from Sahih Muslim, it might be 1764. So basically, there's this man uh, called the Mama, and he is uh, brought to Muhammad, and he's tied to the pillars of a mosque. Muhammad comes out to him and says, what do you have to say? And he says, uh, if you kill me, you will be the one who has shed blood. If you show me kindness, you'll be the one showing kindness. If you want money, then ask, and it will be given to you. Muhammad doesn't like that answer, so he comes to him the next day. The man is still tied to the pillars of a mosque. The same conversation happens. Muhammad's still not happy. He comes back again the next day. The man has been tied to the pillar, pillar of the mosque for three days at this point. And uh, then he's released. He goes into the mosque, and he recites the Shahada after being tied to the pillar of a mosque uh, for three days. Now, you can say that's not compulsion. Not really sure how you would get there. Then, in a rather comical twist, the man goes back to Mecca, and someone says, have you changed your religion? And he says, no, but I submitted to Muhammad. So he takes the shahada to make Muhammad happy. He's untied from the mosque, and then he goes back and clarifies that, no, he just submitted to Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad. Okay, so this is sort of a, a model that Muhammad followed, okay? And as he expanded the Islamic State, this is the model that they took on. They didn't necessarily force people to convert to Islam. Indeed, sometimes that wasn't always the goal, because the jizya is actually more than zakat, right? So if the uh, Islamic State needs financial support, you can't just have Muslims paying zakat, you need the jizya as well, at least in uh, Muhammad's context. That's why Surah 9 was revealed, as Ibn Kathir clearly states in Battles of the Prophet. So when you look at Muhammad's life as a whole, um, how does this no compulsion in religion thing play out? Well, Ibn Ishaq uh, gives a, a great example of this. You, you think about this no compulsion in religion. If you don't want to say it was abrogated like Kathir, there are plenty of other options. Um, so first, this is page uh, 212 of Surat Rizal Allah. Uh, he, that's Allah, gave permission to his apostle to fight and protect himself. Then he says, when they, that is Muslims, are in the ascendant, they will establish prayer, pay the poor tax, and join kindness and forbid iniquity. For those who have read Sharia, forbid iniquity. There's a lot of baggage uh, that goes along with that, a lot of violence that goes along with that. Um, and then God sent down him, fight them so that there be no more seduction until no believer is seduced from his religion, and the religion is God's. Okay, so catch that. When they are in the ascendant, then God sent down, fight people until they believe in Allah. And of course you have uh, Ibn Qayyim, who parallels this very closely. For 13 years after the beginning of his messengership, he called people to God through preaching without fighting or jizya. Later permission was given to fight. Then he was commanded to fight those who fought him. Later he was commanded to fight the polytheists until God's religion was fully established. Very, very close to what we just heard from Ibn Ashaq there. So you have four stages. First, it's preaching. You know, no compulsion. Your religion is yours. My religion's mine. It's Everything's good. Then there's the, uh, the permission given to fight defensively. Then the command to, def to fight defensively. And then finally, uh, you are commanded to spread the Islamic State by force. But again, this is not in conflict with no compulsion in religion. Because you're not forcing people to accept Islam. You're not trying to overturn Allah's decree for who he has decreed will be a Muslim and who won't be. All you're doing is you're forcibly expanding the Islamic State, and you're forcing these people who do not accept Islam to be dhimmis under the Islamic State, pay the jizya, and feel themselves humiliated and subdued, just like the individual who was tied to the pillar of a mosque for three days who finally submitted to Muhammad. So now you know whenever you have you know, Muslims who quote this verse, Surah 2, 256, that it didn't stop Muhammad from committing a lot of atrocities. It didn't stop Muhammad from tying a man to a mosque. It didn't stop Muhammad from waging offensive jihad to spread the Islamic State 
and subjugate people into a demi-status, or you could simply take Ibn Kathir's route. This verse was abrogated by fighting, and there he uh, cites Surah 9. So, lots of different takes on uh, no compulsion in religion, but it by no means implies that Islam is a religion of peace. Have you ever wondered why there are so many a hadith which testify to Muhammad's engraved ring? Have you ever wondered why in the Quran it's said that Solomon was given the power to control the wind? Have you ever wondered why Muhammad thought that some dogs were the shaitan? And after you're finished laughing at the story where a rock runs off with Moses' clothes, have you ever wondered what the source for that story is? Have you ever wondered why the story of Adam and Iblis in the Quran sounds so much like pre-existing legend? We'll be looking at possible answers to these questions and more as we continue a source-critical journey into the primary texts of Islam and the connections between them and tales of mysticism, memoirs of magic, and the folklore of antiquity. I hope you'll join us on my channel for what will no doubt continue to be a fascinating journey through the tales of the ancients.